uh, to talk about what is the correct level of national debt is John Penrose MP, MP for Western Supermare. Over to you, John. Thanks. Is this working? Ah, marvellous, it is working. Um, just as a reassurance to everybody here, uh, when Bill Gates came to speak to the 1922 committee in Parliament, he used a PowerPoint presentation and the IT didn't work. <laughs> so if it can happen to him, it can happen to the best of people, even here at the Big Tent Ideas Festival. So in the grand tradition of being spontaneous and slightly different, I have immediately renamed this presentation because it isn't just about the level, the right level of national debt. This isn't just a question of accountancy. This is a question of justice, of generational fairness, of what kind of a society, what kind of an economy, what kind of a set of, of national accounts and a national balance sheet that we collectively think it is right to bequeath to our children, to our grandchildren, and to other future generations beyond them. So it's, uh, it's pretty big stuff. It's pretty long-term stuff as well. And I just want to set out a quick set of ideas and then uh, get your reactions if I can. So. Uh, this is also a test of the average age of the audience. This is, this is Oliver Twist, it's a very old film. Some of you will recognize it, and those of you who don't, that's because you're below the average age at which people start voting conservative, according to the latest figures. There we are. So now, um, this, is, this is the national debt clock. Uh, it's, uh, you, this, one, this one is the version according to the Taxpayers Alliance, but broadly speaking, um, as you can see, I'll point out two things about it. One is, it's what we technically call a honking big number. Um, and secondly, it's going up really fast. So broadly speaking, this is the IOU that you and I and the government on our behalf is busy writing every moment of every day, and it's got to be repaid at some point. Our children and our grandchildren, future generations, are all going to have to pay their taxes in order to service and at some point presumably to roll over or refund this debt. And you'll find people on the left, incidentally, who will wave their arms around and say, oh, don't worry, it'll all sort itself out, because they kind of view the national debt as kind of a perpetual zero-coupon bond which never, ever gets repaid. Um, Tories, of course, understand that that's not true. Every debt has to be repaid. It's just a question of whether or not you can afford it when the promissory note becomes due. But that's big. It's going up scarily fast. That means that the size of the problem, the size of the liability, which we are asking our future generations to shoulder, is getting bigger and scarier every day. And we'll see if this thing... Yeah. Uh, so it's not just that it's a large IOU. It's also that we are lying about it to ourselves and to everybody else as well. We are addicted to this stuff called debt. It's rather like um, discovering that your parents are secret alcoholics. And they say, oh, well, yes, of course, we have a, a small sherry before supper. But actually, it isn't just a small sherry before supper. They also have a couple of gin and tonics and then half a bottle of whiskey and on and on it goes. Because when we talk about the national debt, and it's not just us, it's everybody in the commentariat, it's all the economists, et cetera, et cetera, what most people mean is this blue bit at the bottom, gilts. Government bonds, it's about £1.7 trillion worth at the moment. You just saw it's going up in the previous slide. That adds up to about 83% of our GDP. Now, that is, incidentally, a nosebleedingly high figure already. That is um, pretty much close to a post-war high um, after we paid the, the initial debt down after the Second World War. Um, it is scarily, scarily high compared to our normal history of such things. But that's only the bit that we talk about. That's only the bit we admit to ourselves. There's all this other stuff, which, if we were the prudential, for example, we would have to acknowledge in our national accounts as being genuinely the same thing as debt. These are, these are IOUs we have written. We're going to have to repay them at some point. What does it make up? Not just the gilts, but also the state pension system. Take the current value of that, or the, the, the current value of all those future promises which we are going to have to pay. That adds up to about £4.4 trillion. Pounds. So it's not 83% of our GDP. That's getting up now in combined to about 300%. Oh, and then before we forget that, of course, let's also talk about some public sector pensions. There's a whole bunch of those which are funded, but also a bunch of others which aren't funded, which have to be paid for out of taxation. So we should add those in too, because they are promises we've made to people. We have to pay them. We can't Welsh on it. We can't back out on it. That gets us to 383% of GDP. So we're up with Venezuela or even higher already at the moment, ladies and gentlemen. And we never, ever admit it to ourselves. We never, ever admit it to our children. This is where your parents, who have got a problem with alcohol, really are hitting the bottle in a very, very, very big way. And then, just to round it all off, we've got the state benefit system. I can't find, it's probably, probably some of you will be better researchers than I am, I can't find what the current value 
of the promises that we are making to pay important things like, um, like, like uh, you know, sickness benefits and so on. You know, really important things that need to be paid. We've promised people we're going to pay them. No one can tell me what the current value of these things is. So there's a socking great big question mark at the top of this. So it's a great deal more serious than we admit to ourselves. Um, and we can't just carry on pretending that all is well. Now, uh, the good news is that somebody has else has spotted it, other than the wise and sagacious people here at the Ideas Tent Festival here in, in, in near Maidenhead. Um, and the Office of Budget Responsibility has clocked it too. They've done it in a slightly different way. What they've said is, looking forward, this is 2021, going out to 2066. They're looking forward and they're saying, what happens to the national accounts if nothing changes, if we just carry on as we are at the moment? And these things here are the annual budget shortfalls. So we aren't in a balanced budget at the moment and it's going to get worse. And if you add all those up together and say what's the effect on the national debt, that's what happens to it. And they are taking all these other, uh, all these other liabilities into account. So broadly speaking, we're okay according to this. It doesn't get much, much worse until about 2030. Um, and then we start to hit liftoff. So we've got some time, ladies and gentlemen. But if we don't do anything, then the future looks pretty bleak. And the trouble with it is that because that's based on current, uh, current as you are uh, policies, there are really two basic things that we could start doing. The classical answers are either you can reduce the size of your liabilities, you can chisel away at the state pension, you can chisel away at the benefit system. You can try and do all of that, and we've done a bit of that already. We've, we've increased the um, retirement age, for example. But Look at the size of the problem. You can't chisel that much off the liabilities of what the government owes to its citizens. If you do, then we will all be living in a very, very cold, unpleasant, hard-edged society. We may be able to do a bit more, but we won't be able to solve the problem just by doing that. Alternatively, you can raise taxes. Well, yeah, that's all very well, but Bear in mind that the number of people paying taxes of working age is going down and down and down as proportion of the, of the population because of the demographic time bomb and the number of people receiving these things called pensions and all these other bits and pieces is going up and up and up. So this shows that if we don't do anything else, either we're all going to have to pay an awful lot more taxes and fewer people are going to have to pay more or the claimants are going to get a great deal less. I don't know about you, but that neither of those two scenarios sounds incredibly attractive. And also, incidentally, neither of them probably gives us enough of an answer to solve that rising blue line and stop it going upwards and upwards forevermore. So if neither of those two look like attractive alternatives, are our children doomed? Is the question. There's supposed to be a red, uh, uh, no, sorry, we seem to be losing red, red colour here. So are our children doomed? Now this is, the, uh, this is the point where those of you of a certain age will recognise Corporal Fraser from Dad's Army and the rest of you will go, yeah what? But anyway, Corporal Fraser from Dad's Army always just say, we're all doomed I tell you. And the reason why is because we will have, be facing some very, very bad stuff. So we need a moral borrowing framework. A way in which we can say, what is it okay to borrow for and what should we not be borrowing for? In the grand tradition of all, uh, all IT stuff, this is now wrapped around when it shouldn't have done. Broadly speaking, what this says is there are three kinds of things, three kinds of spending that we're currently involved in. We can, we can borrow for infrastructure. And this says that it's okay to borrow for infrastructure because if I borrow to, make, to build roads or ports or airports or whatever it might be, those are things which not only do we in this generation enjoy, but future generations enjoy too. We all currently travel on railways which the Victorians built. This is something which if we borrow today and expect our children and our grandchildren to repay the debt, that's okay because they will be using the assets that we have built with that money that we borrowed today. I suppose the modern, modern version of it might be roads, but it might also be digital infrastructure too, and there will be other kinds of infrastructure which we have to construct in future too. We can borrow for that stuff because not only do we use it, but future generations do too. Personal investment, by that I mean investment in health, investment in education and those sorts of things. Those are investments, but I would argue that you can't borrow to fund those because if you or I are paid for, are in, have our education paid for through borrowing, we get a personal benefit from that. If I have a, have a higher, have a master's and that's paid for by borrowing, 
I can borrow to fund that if I want to, but I don't think the taxpayer should be expected to pay for my personal improvement in earnings. Ditto health. If we, there is a public interest in having a healthy population, clearly it reduces the amount of times we all get laid low by, by, uh, by, by illness. It reduces the chances of us all being laid low by another version of the Black Death. Employers have a huge um, interest in having a healthy workforce. But broadly speaking, the main people who benefit from spending on health are the people who are getting the treatment to make them well. The general benefit there is small. Therefore, we can't argue that we should be borrowing and expecting three greats grandchildren to pay for the treatment that you and I are getting in the local hospital today. That's not moral, it's not fair, it's not right. So we shouldn't be borrowing for that, we should be paying for it out of current money, not out of tomorrow's money. Ditto, finally, day-to-day -day spending. It isn't right either to borrow to spend on things like law and order, on policing, on anything else like that. We all know that if we stop spending on policing tomorrow, crime would start to rise pretty instantly. You can't borrow for that and expect three generations to pay for today's policing because they will have their own policing to pay for too. So what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is there's only really one thing which morally we should be and can justify borrowing for, and that is infrastructure. Stuff which we get to use because we built it, but which our children and our grandchildren get to use because it will still be around when they are adults and they are paying taxes for it too. Therefore, it's okay to ask them to shoulder some of that burden, but anything else is, paying, is asking them to pay for our lifestyle today. That's not right, it's not fair, and as we've just seen before, it's also completely unsustainable. So, if that's what the answer is, how do we deliver on it? That's the million dollar question, or the million euro question, given the speech we've just been listening to. So, there are three things which we need to do. Firstly, we need to have balanced budgets across the business cycle. That means, broadly speaking, that the blue line you saw on that slide earlier on, the one that shows the overall level of debt, stops going up. It holds steady. In nominal terms, it doesn't carry on increasing. We stop writing extra IOUs because we are paying for the things which we are consuming today with today's money rather than expecting someone else to pick up the tab for it tomorrow. So we have to have balanced budgets so that we are only borrowing to spend on the stuff which we talked about just now, infrastructure only. Secondly, we need a sovereign wealth fund. This is the point which I guess is really the underlying solution to much of this. Because if you think back to all those other types of debt which I showed you in that earlier slide with the, difference, the different colours on it, all of those other kinds of... Uh, of debt that we owe, the things for the national pension scheme, the things for the uh, national benefits scheme, the thing for the public sector pension schemes. Those values there cannot be repaid today, but we need to make sure that we aren't expecting other people to pick up those, those costs tomorrow as well. The only way you can do that, ladies and gentlemen, is to have a fund that backs up the promises you've made. If the, if the Prudential has a uh, a, a, a pension scheme, then it has to be backed pound for pound, the liabilities have to be backed by investments. And yet, for some reason, we operate a huge double standard in this country, and we don't expect that to happen if it's magically government money. That's not right, it's not fair, effectively it is borrowing to pay for promises that we are making today. The only way to deal with that is to build up a sovereign wealth fund to underpin the state pension scheme, the state benefit scheme, and those public sector pensions as well. And here's the thing. The left will automatically say, because their natural reaction to anything to do with government debt is, it's okay, you don't need to worry about government debt, because if we just grow the economy a bit faster, then it'll all be affordable. If, we, if the economy is twice the size it is today in 30 years' time, then it's easy to afford all this debt, isn't it? Well, that might be true, for the guilt bit, the bit that, everybody, that we do admit to ourselves, the bit that we aren't lying about. But it isn't true for all the stuff which is to do with pensions or benefits or public sector pensions because that stuff doesn't depend on the size of the economy. It depends on the demographic time bomb. It's going up faster than the government, uh, than the economy can grow because we are aging as a society faster than the economy can grow. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the left's answer about don't worry, just invest a bit more in infrastructure and we'll grow the economy faster doesn't work for most of the true national debt. And that is why we need to have the sovereign wealth fund to back it up. And then the final thing, which you absolutely have to have, 
is in order to make sure that you do balance your budget and you do have sovereign wealth funds, you have to have it enforced by strong new institutions. And I say that as someone who sits in the House of Commons on a regular basis, and I don't trust my colleagues not to, not to bugger this up, <laughs> and nor should you. And the, the, current, um, the current state pension scheme is based on a promise. I promise you that if you pay me your taxes today, I will pay your parents' pensions today, and your successors and my successors will fund your pensions tomorrow. So you're depending on my promise. I don't know about you, but that seems a pretty flimsy basis to budget for your retirement. And therefore, what we need to have is some strong institutions which stops future generations of MPs, future generations of policymakers, future generations of politicians of any party, ladies and gentlemen, from welshing on this deal. Because if you, have, if you create a sovereign wealth fund, something that's worth billions and billions of pounds to underpin the promises that we've made, someone creative sometime, the spiritual successor to Gordon Brown, is going to get sticky fingers. They are going to say, ooh, ooh, there's all this money. I bet I can get them to invest in something really, really politically sexy, HS10, whatever it might be. And it will be a rubbish investment. It will be financially disastrous. And all that spending that you and I will have, all that saving rather, that you and I will have done to finance this stuff will go to waste. And therefore you have to have institutions which will back up the independence of this stuff to make sure, firstly, that the government um, budget is balanced. I'm happy to talk about how we might do that. And secondly, to make sure that when you are building up your sovereign wealth fund to underpin the, the IOUs that we are, we are writing, that sticky-fingered politicians can't subvert the whole problem, the whole project. Because bear in mind, that this is a multi-generational task we're talking about here. This isn't just for you and me, or even for our children. This is for grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It will probably take a century to build up the kind of size of fund that we need to fund the size of debts that we have already incurred. And for that to work, it has to be politically robust, politically sustainable. It's got to survive multiple changes of government. And that's why you've got to have institutions which keep politicians' sticky fingers off it. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, is the idea. We either do the Sovereign Wealth Fund and underpin it with independent trustees and all those good things, or we end up with Oliver Twist asking for more money, or rather more food in his case, and we end up with that debt clock going up and up and up from an already stonkingly big number to an impossibly larger number, a number which our children and our grandchildren will never be able to repay. Thank you all very much. I look forward to your comments. Thank you, John. Um, if we have questions from the floor, um, maybe I could add a question of my own and then um, take it to the floor. If uh, debt is basically tax that we're just going to pay sometime tomorrow, that kind of causes us to over to overtax because we don't feel the pain today. If we're not willing to cut spending, then is there a case for just raising taxes to eliminate the deficit now so that we do feel the pain of the stuff that we're spending? You're tempting me to, uh, to write the Chancellor's budget um, for, for this autumn. I mean, the, the first point about this is the, I said we had to have balanced budgets across the economic cycle. There are only two ways of doing that. You can either carry on cutting spending, more austerity, or you can raise taxes. If I had to predict what the Chancellor will do in a, in a couple of weeks' time when he stands up to deliver his, uh, his, his budget statement, I would predict he'll do a bit of both. Certainly earlier on this year, he tried to raise taxes, in fact, he tried to raise national insurance contributions. I had to back off it, but the intention is clear, and actually I would argue that it is a fair and sensible thing to try and do what he was suggesting. So my guess is that both he and any future um, chancellor will have to both continue to bear down on public spending because we need to make sure it's becoming more efficient. The state is delivering things more effectively um, year after year after year. That's what businesses do every year anyway. It's normal in business. We should expect that from our public sector so, um, uh, services as well. But yeah, I can't see how he's going to balance the budget without raising taxes. He probably won't do it all in one go, but I would be amazed if he or future chancellors don't have to do something along those lines. Great, we'll try and get uh, three questions in at a time. Um, thank you. Um, uh, yes, it's Luke. Um, and I was just wondering, I, th um, I think it sounds uh, a, a good concept in theory, but I, I was just curious how the... Um, the contributions to a sovereign wealth fund would be financed. Obviously, places like Norway have uh, the joys of oil, which we... You noticed uh, I glossed no, over that. No longer. <laughs> yeah. But obviously, no. uh, my, my understanding point. is no. public sector pensions currently are... Uh, contributions today are paying for the retirees currently, rather than their own... Policy. In some cases, yeah. 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 
Yeah. Um, what difference does raising things like pension age uh, do, and how much can that dampen or smooth the curve? Because presumably, with developments in longevity, one could potentially do quite something uh, in that regard. Secondly, there's always a problem, is there not, with this generational argument? Because the point is, every generation pushes something on to the next generation. And the only point at which the full costs of your debt fall upon a generation on Earth is when there is no future generation to push it onto. So, so there's, some, there's something, um, what's the right word? Something not quite, that doesn't, isn't captured in this generational account. And you can also, because presumably demographics rises and falls, you know, um, presumably at some future point there'll be a surfeit of young people and, um, and a diminution of older people. And then uh, the, arguably the argument could be the people who paid this was way back in the past. So, so I just wondered where, where you were conceptual on that, because actually the point is, is that, is that is one can one only pay, one is never at a point where one pays the full cost because human beings are a processional species. There's time. Yeah. Try answer those those two. Uh, let, let me start off with a question about the about the the contributions first. I mean, I think I said that this is a long term project. We can't. It's taken decades and generations to build up these promises. Successive governments and successive generations of politicians of all parties have made these promises. We can't expect to fix it um, in a couple of years. So I'm, I'm arguing this is something which we need to start now and we will take several generations to fix. In fact, it's only fair if we take several generations to fix it because otherwise the current generation of taxpayers has to not only pay for the current system but also fund the future one. So you want to spread it over a good long period of time. There are a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, if you run a ba balanced budget, you can run a, um, a budget which has actually got a tiny, tiny, tiny surplus and plough that in every year. Only needs to be tiny and over 50, 70, 100 years with compounding, it grows pretty fast. So you could do that. We're a long way away from that at the moment. And the one thing I'm certain of is that the moment we get the budget to anywhere near a, uh, a, a balance, there will be a long procession of people like me knocking on the, uh, on the Chancellor's door and people like Alan Mack and everybody else saying, I've got this wizard wheeze about how we could just spend just a little bit more money from taxpayers rather than saving it. So that's possible. I would argue it's the superior way of doing it, but it is politically difficult and we're a long way away from doing it at the moment. The other thing you can do is we missed the boat on North Sea Oil, but there are other things like spectrum auctions, which we auction every once in a while. And there could be some revenues from fracking. There could be revenues from all sorts of bits and pieces like that. There's, there's RBS shares, which at some point we might even manage to sell. Um, you could put those proceeds into the Sovereign Wealth Fund and just allow, uh, allow compounding to take its toll. The, port, the important thing, though, is we need to start soon. Even if we start small, we need to start soon because it's like saving for a pension. In fact, it is saving for a pension. And as everybody will tell you, if you save a little bit per year in your 20s, it's a heck of a lot easier than saving a lot a year in your 50s instead. Now, to Philip's points um, about, about humans being a processional species. Um, Philip, you're absolutely right. The, what we currently run is a pay-as-you-go system. Um, which is based on exactly the argument that you described, and it is an entirely respectable argument, except for two points. And the two points are these. Um, firstly, that it doesn't work if you are in the situation we currently have, which is the demographic time bomb. You said what happens if you end up with the opposite of it, which I guess is the democratic something, I don't know what the opposite of a time bomb is, but, um, but when you have uh, your, your demographics, so you have more young people than you do older ones, and there are countries in Africa which are facing precisely that at the moment. We aren't and nobody serious is expecting us to do that for most of the rest of this century. So I guess you are right in theory, but in practice, no one's suggesting that Britain is in that position or likely to be in our lifetimes or anybody alive's lifetimes either. Um, but also the second point is that by its very nature, a pay-as-you-go system is funded out of tax, taxes, today's taxes. That means it is heavily, heavily dependent on the performance of the UK economy and will always be dependent on the performance of the UK economy. If you have a sovereign wealth fund, which like any respectable, properly, independently run uh, pension fund is invested globally, then you are diversifying your risk. You are much, much more uh, independent from and insulated from the risks of a UK recession 
and it means that even when you have a couple of bad years in the UK, and that, that, that isn't a question of if, it's a question of when and how often, when that happens, not if, then you are better insulated against that, and it means you can weather those storms. It also means, incidentally, that when you have a humongous problem, like we had in 2008-9 with a financial crash, that you are much better placed, you have a much stronger balance sheet to take really big steps, really big moves. Because at the moment, what happens is, because we pay for things out of tax, when the pressure comes on, politicians start scurrying around, looking down the back of, uh, back of sofas, metaphorically speaking, looking for cash. And what that does, it means that there may be some really important strategic moves which Britain ought to take at that point in future, which we just won't have the cash to, to, to deal with. To, to give you, hang on, let me finish the point and then I'll come back to you. To give you an example, within our living memory, not our country, um, German reunification. Yeah? Had Germany not had a really strong national balance sheet and had taken on Eastern Europe, which is an incredibly important strategic move, obviously, they would have found it a great deal harder to cope with. Um, but they did have a strong balance sheet. They could cope with it. Now, you know, we aren't likely to have that particular scenario, but it's an absolute racing certainty that over the course of the next century, there will be a couple more very, very serious crashes and that there will be big strategic opportunities which we will not be able to take if we don't have the cash available. Do you want to come back to I'm, me? I'm afraid that's actually all we've got time oh, for. That was, um, the, that was the, the, the whistle. Thank you very much, John.